Hi, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology. This is the last video of a series of videos that I've been filming uh, on how quickly the rapidity of our of the climate changes that are occurring in 2016 and how it applies, you know, how you can take that global uh, change and apply it to, for example, to local levels, to environmental assessments, which don't uh, consider climate change at all. And in fact, if we were going to be completely honest with ourselves, then if you did a proper climate assessment, um, then we just would not be building any more fossil fuel projects, period. So anyway, let me get the lights. So in the last video, I was talking about some of the dangers from continuing to procrastinate and how global food supply is going to be is the, 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 the weak link in the whole system, the thing that will cause us the most grief and wake people up to climate change. Um, and I showed the GMO commodity index, which is a 33 commodity index, and you can see World War I spikes, World War II spikes, oil shock spikes, and how it spiked um, in 2010 um, when oil prices were much higher than the world could sustain. So it caused a rapid rise in food prices and a spike. So we basically have a serious issue on our hands. We need to declare a global climate change emergency to reflect what is actually happening with the climate system, which is in an emergency, and apply three-legged bar stool um, solutions to the problem. But here I'm going to talk about how, you know, going from the global to the local scale. You're living in a particular region, you know, how is it going to be affected by climate change? Um, Manitoba is just an example. And the environmental assessment process is an example, but these sort of this type of thinking can allow you to assess what will happen to your region as climate change continues to rapidly accelerate. So in all regions, you can get the climate history, the temperature and precipitation, say over the last century, uh, Manitoba in my example. So historical averages and trends. These are often used as a basis uh, to for future expected projected changes. This method is very pro is prone to very large errors and uncertainties because the global climate changes that I've been discussed have essentially changed the statistics <coughs> of the climate and those weather events. So this data over the last century is useful but we need to be very careful that we don't give it too much merit uh, because the statistics are changing. So part of the statistical change is variability. It has increased across most time scales, whether it be decadal, year to year, seasonal, seasonal, seasonal monthly or weekly time scales even. So think of weather weirding, weather whiplashing. To give you an example, the Mississippi River in the US had record flood levels one year, then record low levels the next year. The US Army Corps had to blast the rocks off the sea bottom to keep traffic moving, barges moving. And then the next year after that, record flood levels again, even worse than the previous flood levels. You know, a given city or location can have record high temperatures one week, record low temperatures the uh, following week, and then swing back to record high temperatures the subsequent week. This whiplashing up and down um, depends on the, where the region is relative to the jet stream wave. So think of the jet stream wave, you know, a ridge down to a trough. And you're right here in the trough right now. And then this thing moves and you go in the ridge and then it moves past you and you're in another trough. So you can get this type of weather whiplashing. Uh, it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what hemisphere you're on. Um, climate projections are based on downscaling the global circulation model. So we've got these very sophisticated atmospheric ocean GCMs. Um, and we can downscale them. These are, the grid size is very large because they have to cover the entire planet. Um, so we can downscale them to our given region uh, to see what happens. And this makes sense when these GCMs um, are accurate. In other words, we have a slowly varying linear climate system. 
there's nothing linear about our climate system anymore. We're very non-linear. Um, so it's risky to rely on these models and the downscaling when we're getting very rapid changes in the climate system that I've been discussing. Um, if you look at the hydroclimate, the water studies, look at lake levels, stream flows, water temperatures, based on data from the last century and these um, regional models, they, you can only trust them so far because the variability is greatly increasing, like I've said. So these studies will be much less accurate. Since the climate statistics have changed, these probabilities that are based on a stable climate, for example, you'll hear of this was a one in a hundred year event. This was a one in a thousand year event. What does this mean? It's nonsensical. It, makes, it means nothing when we have three 1,000 year events. Uh, one in a thousand year events within a decade, for example, those statistics are no longer valid because they they are based on a stable, the assumption of a stable climate system, which we no longer have. So in this case, more weighting on recent behavior over the next near over the most recent decade is probably a better way to assess it than looking at, say, back 100 years. Uh, for example, with water temperature in Lake Winnipeg, very large, very shallow lake. Um, during heat waves, there's a lot more evaporation um, and the lake volume will decrease and there will be much greater risk of eutrophication and blue-green algae blooms. So in Lake Erie in the summer of 2014 on the western part of the lake, which is a very shallow lake, the temperatures were so high, we got these algae blooms Blue-green algae, cyanobacteria, contaminated the water supply. Uh, millions of people had to import bottled water because many people got sick just drinking the trap water. Even though it was treated, it was full of the cyanobacteria, which is very small and got through the filters. Uh, rivers are changing. The mean discharges of rivers are changing and the timing of meltwater in the river the timing of things is all different. Glacially fed rivers are drying up because of declining snowpacks in the mountains. Steadily rising temperature trends at mountain temperature trends at mountain elevations are causing rapid decline of mountain glaciers. 20% decline in spring snow cover throughout the Rockies since 1980. So glaciers that feed these rivers are losing more and more mass, and when they're no longer there then these rivers will, the flow in these rivers will greatly decrease. It's not just, we're not talking just North America. Runoff from snowpack supplies between 60 to 80% of annual water supplies to 70 million people in the American West, but billions of people in, in Asia. So, so these glaciers are, as these glaciers are going in the short term, you can get surges in water sometimes, which is like a last gasp of the glacier. And also it leads to um, disputes between provinces or states, for example. So one unit of water input into the Saskatchewan River in Alberta, Alberta can take 50% of the flow. Saskatchewan, 50% of the flow that's left over, so 25% of the input, Manitoba the rest. As the flow level, if the slow level drops in half, does Alberta say, okay, we need to keep all of the water and give these guys nothing? And then you can have uh, disputes between provinces or states, so inter-country uh, disputes. This is becoming common already in the, the U.S. Um, these climate normals or averages because of rapid changes, they don't mean so much. I mean, we try to analyze things, data. We do things, a lot of things traditionally, but we can no longer do that because the climate system is changing so fast. We must consider these changes in everything we do. The Lake Winnipeg Basin, for example, has been wet the last 15 years or so. There's no expectation this will continue um, because the drought, the Palmer Drought Severity Index shows that we're going to much, uh, a lot of dryness in the future. And I'll just bring up that, uh, I'll just back up. I think that's, that's uh, there's one more slide. So yes, yeah, so, so this, there's no expectation that because something is happening that it will continue. Um, we're going from one stable state of the planet's climate to another stable state. 
In between is the transition, which is where we are. So there's nothing normal. There's nothing, because something happens one year doesn't mean it's going to happen the next year or the one after. Everything is changing as we go through this abrupt climate change transition. So uh, overall, it doesn't matter in, whether you're in Manitoba or anywhere in the planet. Historically and traditionally, the, when we do a new project, we do an environmental assessment. We only look at the local and regional direct effects on the environment during the construction, perhaps short-term time periods. To account for climate change, we need to consider the effect of this project in the near and long term and what it means in a rapidly changing climate. So we definitely need to look at the greenhouse gas emissions from the construction and the operation of the project over its lifetime. We also need to consider indirect greenhouse gas emissions from operating the project, or at least if we're... So we need a price on these emissions because these emissions are causing great damage to us, great damage to society, and uh, are threatening the ability of us to uh, grow food, like I said, is, is the, the major factor. And uh, this is... Uh, so we'll finish up here. So I've done many videos here. Um, and I've tried to carry them from the global to the local. So let me use a few minutes to talk about this three-legged bar stool. So leg one, we need to slash fossil fuel emissions as quickly as possible. But that's not sufficient. We're in a climate emergency and this is not sufficient. There's still, we need to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. This is the only way to bring down the acidity in the oceans to normal levels and preserve the marine food chain. So carbon dioxide removal, for example, using biomimicry, um, using, uh, you know, we can't keep continuing to lose uh, sinks of carbon dioxide, uh, vegetation on the planet. Um, we can't continue to um, do, do what we're doing. We have to do carbon dioxide removal and bring these CO2 levels down from four, approaching 410 parts per million down to 350. Uh, and we also need to, that's leg two of the BARS tool. Leg three is solar radiation management. We have to apply technologies, deploy technologies to try to cool the Arctic, to make sure that the sea ice stays there um, as a reflector of heat from the planet to make sure that the methane that is in the permafrost on land and in the seafloor sediments does not come up and dwarf all human emissions very quickly within several years. Um, and we have to avoid exponential rise of sea level from Greenland. So if we lose all the sea ice and snow cover in the Arctic, then the melt rates of Greenland will skyrocket uh, with a correspondingly skyrocketing global sea level rise, which will which will cause humanity no end of grief. So we have to A, declare a global climate change emergency, and B, apply and deploy the three-legged bar stool solution set as soon as possible to give humanity a fighting chance to address these issues. And we need to the public to really recognize what is going on and what we must do to address it. You know, that's enough of talking about affairs or emails, you know, for a year in a presidential election cycle, for example, and ignoring the, the true issues that I've been discussing in this series of videos. Anyway, thank you for your time. Uh, my website is paulbeckwith.net and please uh, ensure that I can continue to do these videos by a small uh, financial donation on my website, uh, which is connected to PayPal. Uh, I do not get any funding uh, by anybody except for people that watch my videos. So thank you again for your time and the importance of these videos I think is going way up given the uh, political system in the US uh, a few weeks ago. So uh, thank you for your time and I'll be continuing these videos and feel free to uh, give me uh, lots of suggestions on what you really want me to talk about. Thanks again.